Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, we're glad that you joined us. And I say you stand up on your feet, and we invite you to sing along as we worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
so we call upon the name of the Lord. There's no other name that could say. So we call upon. Well, it's good to have you guys here with us. We're going to do something a little different this morning. We're going to come down and shake some hands out there. These guys are going to get some music cranked up for us. We want to meet you, so go around and greet one another. We're going to come down and meet you as well.
You may be seated at this time. Good morning. Welcome to the service today. And if you're watching online, we're glad you're joining us as well. Today is the first day of our fall intensive, and it is entitled Taking Charge of the Things That Matter in Life. And so this just speaks that you want to do that. So uh, we're glad you're here. I'm going to invite the ushers to come and take up tithes and offerings. And of course, if you're not going to do it this way, you can see the ladies at Grand Central and you can always give online at any time. So um, anyways, we are glad to be celebrating today, first day of fall. And, uh, but I want to go over a few announcements of what's taking place. Now, I have some good news and some bad news about the Wednesday. So when we start an intensive, we always uh, do the, the message on the Sunday. But then on the Wednesday following, we go deeper. Now... We get a chance to gather together as small groups uh, around tables. We get to meet other people, and uh, we get to go deeper into what was taught on the Sunday morning. Now, the good news is that's fantastic that we get to do that. The bad news is it's not online. And so if you want to go deeper, you need to come out on Wednesday evening. Uh, the study begins at 6.30, goes till 7.45. You can come earlier for supper, for purchase, and that begins at 5.45 to 6.30. And of course, we have classes for all your children up to grade eight. And so you can take them to the reach accordingly or to here in the uh, main building, etc. So again, that is Wednesday. We're going deeper because of the subject matter, and we need to just continue to uh, grow in what God is speaking to us. So we're going to be doing this for six weeks, six Wednesdays, and uh, so we hope that you will be a part of that and not try not to miss any of it because it's always fantastic. Now, we're going to show you a little bit of a video on the small groups. Very relaxed atmosphere. I'm always excited to host a group. It's always nice to invite new people to the church and um, give them the feeling that they belong see new faces that I haven't seen as much over the summer and just uh, reconnect with old faces. Great to be able to share our experience and enjoy it with others. Yeah, it just brings a, a feeling of community when you can participate in something like that. Really nice to get connected with people that are experiencing life. <laughs> and ups and downs and trials and just know that you're not alone. And getting to know a couple members of the church in, on a deeper level than just high every Sunday. We realize how important it is to open relationships with more and more people in the entire church community, not just you know one or two people that you know. It just, it's a real binder. It, it brings people together. There is a group for everybody. There is a place for every single person. If you're considering leading a group, you just need to be present, it's not difficult. And if you're considering coming and you're on the fence about it, just try it. Then we're going to go on to, I want to let you know that what's taking place in November, we have Will Graham, who is a grandson to Billy Graham, and he is coming to our peace country, and he is going to be speaking on two nights, so the November 8th and November 9th at the Bonnet Center, and uh, well, this is a big event that we are um, just spreading throughout all the churches, um, like Fort Mc not Fort McMurray, Fort St. John, uh, just all in the north, etc. And people are making this an event to bring people to and invite people to that do not know Jesus Christ. And so I say that to stay, put that on your calendar. But before that, we have on October 5th, one more class where you get to be trained in how you can invite people to the crusade, to the event, and uh, what you can do, um, just how you can... Uh, reach out to people that you know that might be um, in search. Of course, everybody is searching for something, but they don't know, always know that they need Jesus. And so this will just give you the tools to help you through that. And so you can sign up. If we did it in the spring in April, our church hosted it, but we, uh, we would love to have some more representation from our church involved in that. So that is October 5th. It starts at 10 o'clock, and that's at McLaurin Church, and uh, you can uh, register for that. And so 
if that's something that you would be interested in being part of that and working at the uh, Will Graham Lookup uh, in November, sign up for that and be a part of that. Does that characterize your life right now? You're desperate? Are you at the place where you want to give up? And you really wonder, is there a God? Is there a God that really cares about me? My friends, there is a God and He does care about you. God sees it. He knows everything that's going on. He knows what you're worrying about. He knows what you're laughing about. He knows everything about you. He doesn't turn a blind eye to it. All right, so we're going to have a song special for you guys. Brenda and the choir have been working on this for a few weeks. So we hope that you guys enjoy it. It's a rendition of the song, Because He Lives.
And uh, if singing is something you're interested in and you want to join us, just get a hold of myself or Brenda. We'd love to have you. It's a lot of fun, and uh, you get to meet some new people, so you're, you're more than welcome. Uh, let's stand together, and we're going to continue singing. I switched them. I forgot to tell the drummer. <laughs> I just like messing with you. Yeah. I come on one thing, the same God that never fails. take a moment and bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you've never once failed us. We thank you, God, that no matter what we're going through, you remain the same, steadfast. You are our rock. And Lord, we thank you also that you don't want to leave us where we're at. You want us to grow. And uh, Lord, that takes effort. That takes work. Sometimes it takes pain, courage, 
So over these next six weeks, Lord, that's our prayer. Grow us, grow our faith in you. And Lord, help us to see things through your eyes and your, pers- your perspective as, as we walk. Bless this, the rest of this service and everyone here. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Please be seated at this time. I think sometimes where we feel the most overwhelmed is going to be the subject of the day. 
where you are probably already in enough pain or been through enough pain that you uh, often freeze up in these kinds of areas of our life. We're going to be talking over the next six weeks about taking charge of the things that matter. I think you would agree that not everything matters of equal importance within life. There are certain things that rise above other things. And so throughout this next six weeks, and also on Wednesdays, doubling up on which we will be going into more of the real practical tools that you can use. And uh, don't miss Wednesdays. So the first trails we're going to go down is going to be three. The first one is relationships. How do we build quality into our relationships? This is an area where, as I said, you're already probably in some pain, maybe some great degrees of pain. It might be sort of that underlying and slow burn like a peat fire that you'll see even in our country. I know southern Manitoba, they've got these peat fires that go on and you see smoke rising up and it's just because years and years and years ago there was a fire, went underground and it still smolders and still goes. There's all different forms of this kind of pain and hurt and that builds into things like our anger levels, our fear levels. We're going to talk about those things. We're going to talk about a word, especially this Wednesday, about how do you achieve safety in relationships. Safety is a key word. It is a fundamental word that either releases you to draw close to other people, or if you don't feel safe, you definitely pull away. Uh, We tend to look at it through personality lens, but it's that's the not the way to look at safety. Not even the like lens, that you like this person. Safety is defined differently and how you achieve it is very, very important because you can go about trying to get safety and be very destructive to yourself and others. You may be doing that right now, but I'm not talking about that today. But I do want to talk about some things that are really important as an introduction in relationships. It's what... It's the quality of your own life, of your own understanding and control of your strengths and your response to your weaknesses. That really, can I say, puts you in the right position so that you are able to be strong in relationships and persevere the times you need to persevere and really enjoy the times that are a little bit easier, a little bit more on the upside of things. Either way, relationships will take you through everything in life. You're going to go through, as Scott Peck talked about, you're going to go through tunnels of chaos. You're going to go through all kinds of chaotic things in relationships because it's people. It's you. And that ends up creating an environment where if we do not have the right tools, if we do not have the right positioning within ourselves, then frankly, we're not going to do so well in relationships. Today, Loneliness is chronic. There's reasons for that. Cultural changes, but those cultural changes come as sometimes we would have to look at it as a result of decisions rather than just the change in our culture. We change our culture. So we must have changed for the culture to change. There's certain things that we hold to and things that we didn't uh, hold to. So let's talk about taking charge of things that matter first. The power center of relational health. And the power center to relational health is basically what you are are becoming and how you respond and react. Those two words are critical things when it comes to understanding uh, what tears down relationships or what builds them up. So let's talk about the key to happiness in our relationships. Look what it says in Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. This is not a nice term in most of our languages. We tend to not understand meekness or the word blessed in this particular uh, usage. It basically its strongest interpretation would be happy are those Happy are those. Happy are the meek. If you think meek is weakness, then how in the world can you be happy? Meekness is not weakness. Let's start really, really clear with this so we have a good understanding of what meekness really is. Meekness is something far greater than just that. Now, this is the only beatitude out of eight of them that Jesus didn't just originate within that teaching. He's quoting the Old Testament here. And he quotes Psalm 37, 11 in this beatitude. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. 
peace. You know, it's a kind of peace where that doesn't mean you never have problems. You're not in the, middle of pro- in the midst of problems. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with an inner condition, an approach, a strength out of which you are living no matter what you are up against, whether you're on a mountaintop or a deep, low valley. This kind of peace is referencing a spiritual condition which is guiding and leading your life. It is a source, a resource in your life. This is a key to relationships. Meekness which results in this kind of peace. More or less, you're always working for the strength of things. You're not slipping into the tear down mode. You're not going into trails where it's destructive to you or to others. The meek shall inherit the earth. Happy are the meek. Happy are the meek. So what is meekness? Let's talk a little bit about it. Meekness cannot be translated by any single English word. You can't take one English word and put it next to weakness and then you got it. It means things like this. Gentle, humble, forgiving, teachable, under control, etc., etc. A lot of words are required for us to understand the many dynamics of meekness. Aristotle put it this way. He said, power under control. He said, meekness is power under control. More or less, you can't say it's weakness. It is power that is under control. By the way, power under control has, is when it reaches its full potentials of good. When you have power and you have it under control, you can use that power for good. When you don't have control of power, you don't have it under control. You can become a great agent of destruction. You may be a great critical thinker and a great arguer and through that strength destroy a marriage or destroy a friendship because the fight's more important to you than the outcome because your meekness is not in place. But if you have a heart that leans towards meekness and is learning the the controls that meekness will bring over your strengths, then your power goes into a category of being used for good. Meekness is also the happy medium between the extremes of reckless anger and total passivity. This is where people often, you know, look at at that and they think, well, uh, meekness is not being angry. Well, that would be completely wrong. But meekness is not having reckless anger, endangerment of yourself and others. Meekness is able to be angry. The Bible even commands us, be angry and don't sin. Anger is an emotion that has really great merit and need. I get concerned with people who say things that I, I just don't get angry. I'm like, why? Don't you see the wrong? Don't you hate the evil? Why are you not angry? Why are you not angry about when self-centeredness is seen destroying people that you love or, or even in your own life? Anger is not your enemy, but it needs to be under the control of meekness and also passivity. This is one I think that scares us the most. It's sort of like I have to be this little weak agent of my opinions or back my opinions right up or, or I don't have to, you know, I, I'm not supposed to take strong conviction stands and, or that might offend somebody in the room. It has nothing to do with that. In fact, if you're passive like that, you are not meek. You are weak. You are weak. Because you are playing to people. You're playing fear of people. And that bars you from building relationship. See, when we talk about meekness, it's finding that middle road between those things, the balanced way to deal with anger, a balanced way to deal with passivity and not become that passive person. I've seen people try to be meek and they always go quiet and they always go kind of withdrawn. And they want to call that meekness. You might be the furthest thing from meek because all you're doing is you're becoming passive so that you don't have to have any emotional upset or even experience any anger. You'll just keep it underground. How good is that for the relational life? Underground stuff is the stuff that does the great damage in relationships. This is why when you see people who are not emotionally honest with with what they're going through, it kind of concerns you and you wonder what's going on. 
They're misinterpreting what meekness is. When somebody won't challenge an opinion or you can't enter a conversation about difficult matters with because they're going to become so passive and withdrawn, you know, if I bring this up, they're just going to shut up. They're just going to withdraw. They're going to go hide. How in the world can you communicate or converse towards actual solutions, even identifying real problems? It takes the kind of exchanges that are built in honesty and controlled by meekness. Meekness is an amazing quality for happiness because it says, happy are the, happy are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, what does that mean? It's not talking about someday, you know, after the second coming or whatever. It's talking about right now. You will inherit the earth, meaning this, that what God intended life to be like here on this planet for us, you will be inheriting that life. That life that's directed, as we read in Psalm, by peace. Something within us that is able to lead us through anger. To keep us involved with the real world and not just shut up and go away. That keep us engaged in the things that build relationship and move towards people with love. When it comes to these things, it, we discover that there's three basic ways that we can deal with people in our life. There's three paths that you're basically going to go down. One, you can relate to them in fear. Fear is a very great negative. It causes you to be defensive. It moves you away from people. It's that run and hide. It's more likely connected to the passivity. You may be one that explodes and then goes passive. You know, all of these different ways that we react is largely because of fear. Fear, when it is a part of relationship building, destroys health because meekness cannot be found in fear. Fear is the kind of thing where you cannot move closer to somebody, it constantly pushes you away. It's Adam and Eve in the garden hiding on God. Where are you? Why are you hiding? What have you done? It's moving away from him. It's moving away from people you love. Fear. The fear of rejection. Huge fear. Fear of failures. But Fear of rejection is, is this, I don't feel safe. I come back to that word, which we're going to talk about because I want to talk on Wednesday about the things you're, that you're not doing and they create this thing in your life that gets very difficult to break out of. But I want to show you, how you what it is and how to break out of it. Many of you are lonely because of this thing. Because this is where you are running away in fear. And when you run away in fear, you end up in the place we're going to talk about on Wednesday. Second, we can relate to them in anger, which moves us against them. The other causes us to run and hide. The other moves us against them. And so if we're going to really get serious about relational health, and we're going to really do it differently, meekness is the quality that must deal with anger. If anger is not controlled by meekness, you will go against in the wrong way. You will attack. You will diminish. You will demean. You will do whatever it takes to win. Because it becomes absolutely competitive. And when things become competitive, then there's a winner and there's a loser. How many times... If you're a married person today, have you had fights about things that maybe you shouldn't have had a fight, but it broke down into a competitive situation? So you had to win. Meekness is absent from those kinds of exchanges. The next is we can relate to them in love. We can come together with them in love because we come together with understanding of them and, and, and we're seeking to understand and not just present. We, we have a much more balanced approach. We're not way up here in anger and we're not way down here in fear. Instead, we're finding that middle ground where meekness lives. Here are five kinds of people you have to deal with in life. There's going to be basically five kinds of people that you will deal with. Number one, those who serve you. You know you got people that serve you all the time. After you leave this place, somebody's going to serve you some kind of lunch or some kind of thing. It might be at home. It might be at one of the restaurants. Uh, we had 13 or 14 food trucks out here. Well, we didn't. They came and we let them use our parking lot. And 
Lynn and I came down. You know what? We're walking around and looking at all these food trucks. I didn't know we had so many food trucks in Grand Prairie, by the way. Now I know why we're having a little trouble with our middle sections anyway. <laughs> so I'm walking around with Linda. We're doing the, you know, the, the loop. And as we're going along, we're looking at what's there. And we get to the end of the loop. We ran into a couple uh, here that were, they had made their decision. And I said to them, you know, I'm going to be here about two hours because it's going to take Linda that long to decide <laughs> what she's going to order and which food truck. It's, uh, when, when we talk about, when we talk about people who serve us, you're being served all of the time. And most of the time, our responses to them can be, well, not the best, largely because we don't understand the power of meekness. And so if things are in competition and we think, well, they serve us, they get paid for it. They serve us. So, great. Rather than understanding that they serve you, that cashier at the till, you know one of the hardest things for them to take at work is when people come through their line and they're bringing with them these wrong expectations and they're in an angry kind of mood and they are not being very, very respectful or understanding of them. Those who serve you. Philippians 2, 4 to 5 says, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. He's saying, look, even when people are serving you, if you have the mindset of Christ Jesus, you're actually there to serve them. Have you ever thought about that, standing in a cashier line? Linda and I do. We've trained ourselves, like I'd say on this. What can we do to leave a little thing with them? How can we express a kindness towards them? How can we make a little connection with them? Just so that in their day, they had a little bit of an experience that may have been service towards them. It's an interesting thing, this Christian faith you and I live. It's so easy for us in our humanity to forget what other people are bringing to the party and not understand. Serving those who serve you. When they serve you, they may not be happy themselves. So what do you do? Do you react? Or do you act? Do you act in a way that's going to actually change the situation? That's the power of meekness where it allows you with great strength that's targeted and aimed to not let the environment be shaping you in reaction or controlling you, but you are able to be in control of the environment because you have a control over the reactions. You might have been there already this morning or certainly maybe this last week where you know you got so close to reaction that almost went over some lines. Maybe you did. Maybe you went over some lines. And the reason is, is largely because we are not understanding what's going on. We're not comprehending. We instead don't see ourselves as serving them, but they are to serve us and they're not making us too happy right now. Those who serve you, you're going to have somebody serve you today, I guarantee you. The question about that is, how is meekness going to change that exchange in your life? They may do well with it. They may not do well with it. Are you going to ride that emotional up and down? How many times have you gone home and a anger picked up after driving home because of other driver? How much are you in reaction to everything around you rather than having a controlled action, which is always working towards peace because you have peace here, because you're happy, because you have meekness. And that meekness is setting you up to drive control of environment out here, not in a reaction, but rather in actions that actually change what is transpiring. The second kind of people you're going to run into is those who disappoint you. This is difficult. Disappointment and being disappointment, be disappointed is a very difficult pain in life. The problem with it is that it happens so regularly. Now, whether that's because of your expectations being where they shouldn't be, or whether that's because there's an actual failing on their part. 
when you feel like you have been disappointed, they didn't hit the mark, then often we become very judgmental. We move towards them in judgment. You let me down. You disappointed me. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. It's a form of hurt, but it's a specific form of hurt. It is every day we feel disrespected. We feel like we haven't received that. Folks, I can tell you, this is life. You're going to get disappointed. Is there any parent here that has raised a kid to the age of at least 10 who has not been disappointed? Would you be proud and raise your hand? Your kid's not in the room. It's okay. How many here are married for longer than one minute and have not been disappointed? (laughs) Disappointment is a product of existence. Largely, that's just the frame of human relationship. It never matches. Have you ever been disappointed in a teacher in your life, disappointed in a boss in your life, disappointed in a friend in your life, disappointed? Just keep the list going, and of course you have been. But if you are a person that reacts simply because meekness is not in control, because meekness is not a quality that you have really built in, then you are being controlled by other people's actions and thoughts and determinations and by the standards that they set for themselves, rather than... Meekness. The greatest freedom is the freedom for you to control your response, your reactions. You don't need to be in a position where what is happening is in charge of how you are going to respond or react. You have something deeper. That's where meekness. Happy are those, happy are the meek. Why? Because I'm not controlled by your, 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 your disappointing me. I'm not controlled by the way that you serve me or don't serve me. I, I'm, I'm in a place where that's not going to be in control of my peace. We give up peace like this. Galatians 6, 1 says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. He's saying, look, when you have people around you that disappoint you, that maybe even sin against you, if they do that, he's saying, you need to have a gentle response. You need to have a response where you are, not, you are acting out something different than, than what is being brought to you. But you watch yourselves, he says, or you also may be tempted. More or less, he's saying reaction feeds reaction. If you want to just react, you're going to get more reaction. Now, that is the spiral. We all know it. We all know it. We get offended, something happens, and in our relational world, then we say something, then they say something, then we say something, then... And pretty soon you got this thing going on and, you, and, and, and it's just getting more ratcheted up. It's getting, it's getting harder to manage. You see, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Is it that not that you want something, you want something, but you just can't get it. So you quarrel and you kill, James chapter 4. The idea is that's the cycle of reaction. And in life, If we're stuck in reaction, that's going to cause us to retreat from relationships because we run from what we fear. And pretty soon we begin to fear the pain of any conversation. We have to converse. We should. We've got to build this friendship. We've got to build this sibling relationship. We've got to build this family relationship. But you can't build it when we run. And when we run, we end up in a place we're going to talk about on Wednesday night. And then it really digs big holes. That can be very difficult to get out of. Show you how. The fact is, is that this is a part of your life. And your reaction is critical to this. And if you're judgmental, then you will be judged. Jesus said, how you actually judge and treat others, you're going to be judged like that. Number three. Those who disagree with you. Those who disagree with you. Can I just go to marriage one more time? How many here are married and they are in total agreement about everything? I mean, everything. Come on, be proud. Come on. I promise I won't rip you to shreds. Okay. 
Some of the most dangerous questions in my household are, so what do you think of the new recipe we, I just made? <laughs> How does this look on me, really? <laughs> when we're talking about this kind of disagreement, agreement is not always the goal. You may not agree, but it's okay to disagree as long as you do it agreeably. And you say, but then they get reactive. Well, then just don't you get reactive and don't run the cycle up. Run out of a peace because you have this wonderful happiness that comes out of being meek. Happy are the meek. For they will inherit the, the, the earth. Happy are the meek because they will inherit great relationships. Relationships that aren't stuck in fear reactions or anger reactions. I know how close to home this runs to all of us. I recognize that. But then there's a time to just take charge. And it seems like an oxymoron to take charge by being meek. Well, if you think meek is weak, then yeah, it is a total oxymoron. If you think meek is the practice of strengths and power rightfully used by love, then you're really starting to get the picture. How you can be meek and how you can take charge. Because taking charge is not taking control of another person, not in relationships. Taking charge is not manipulating or coercing another person or using anger or intimidation. It's not using fear and disappearing from the scene and I'm not coming back until they decide they will agree with me or make me safe. That's not safety. When it comes to disagreement and meekness together, if you're going to take charge of this, Meekness does it the best simply because it never goes to the extreme of anger or fear, but it never denies those things, but it allows itself to come down the middle and bring strength to yourself because the one you must take charge of to build relationships is first you. And that's why meek people are happy people because they're in charge of themselves. Now here's another thing. Meek is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. In Galatians, we are told there are nine fruit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, temperance, faith. It's one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And many of us, you know, we hear this today and we say, I, I know me and I can't do this. Like I blow up. I go hide, I retreat. And I can't, that middle, I, I've never been able to do it. We'll talk about it more on Wednesday. But you must understand that it's not you making a few mental adjustments. It's you making yourself vulnerable and surrendering to the greatest and safest love in the entire universe, which is God's. Which in that understanding, you've got a place where meekness can be built and flow from. And he is by his spirit going to produce that in you just simply because you will surrender to the need of it and say, God, I need meekness far more than I need to win this fight. I need meekness far more than I need to win this disappointment. It's a spiritual commodity, meek. 2 Timothy 2.23 about disagreement says this. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. Because you know they produce quarrels. That's a really interesting scripture. He, he's not saying, you know, have a little to do with it. He says don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. Okay. Stupid arguments are most of the arguments you have in life and that I have in life. 
when we get arguing about things that don't matter in the end and you win those arguments, you actually have lost. Most of the arguments you would win that would cause relational shattering or hurt or disappointment in the other. Do you feel a need to press the point to such a degree that they have to be in the kneeling surrender position because you have the greater skill of command of thought and the ability to make your points. What did you win? Where did things get advanced? Where did the relationship actually thrive? What gain was there for happiness? You say, oh, I'm happy I won. That won't last long. Because pretty soon you won't be happy because the relationship is much more distant and the respect that was once there is not there in the same way. We need to take charge through meekness and achieve the peace that comes from the heart. That commodity of fruit from the Spirit of God which gives us the wisdom to recognize we're not going to fight about a stupid thing like this. Most of, the, most of the tension in relationships comes from the most simplest of disagreements that have nothing to do with anything of importance. Analyze it for a minute. I couldn't find this. Why did you put it there? Why didn't you film me? Why didn't you... How could you not, you know, really notice that? I worked on that a long time. How come you didn't notice? We will fight tooth and nail over things that literally don't amount to anything. Another category of people you're going to have to deal with in life is those who correct you. They correct you. They tend to see themselves as the teachers of the universe. There, it says in Proverbs 19, 8, the one who gets wisdom loves life. The one who cherishes understanding will soon prosper. Look, there's a negative correction that comes. You, there are people who are always going to be correcting you. And then there's people that need to correct you. They're not the same category. When you have a boss or you are a boss and you run into this, I'm sure, and you are developing an employee or you're working with a situation where you're trying to upgrade skill or attitude, and in that pursuit of an increased skill or attitude, they will not receive from you because they're unteachable, because they perceive correction in the negative category, which is, you know, correction is just people that want to adjust and control me. Are you teachable? Meekness makes you teachable. Meekness puts you in a position where you can take truth in. Evaluate it. Take the good, leave behind that which isn't. Meekness allows your brain to work with your heart. It says, the, the one who gets wisdom loves life. The one who cherishes understanding will soon prosper. It's good to grow in understanding and wisdom. And the next scripture says, whosoever or whoever disregards discipline comes to poverty and shame. But whoever heeds correction is honored. Basically just saying, are you teachable? Can you be taught? Or have you put in correction into the prideful response? You're only reactive to correction. You are not open to the truth that might be resident within that correction. You're going to run into that in life. And number five, those who hurt you. Those who hurt you. This is, again, a normal thing in life. You will be hurt. If you haven't been hurt recently, I don't know where you've been. Hurt is a part of life. Do you know God hurts? Even with his perspective? The scripture, better a patient person than a warrior. Well, that's, that's an interesting comparison. 
Better a patient person, which patience would be another fruit of the Spirit, which is connected to meekness. Better a patient person than a warrior. One with, better one with self-control than one who takes a city, like a military victory. So he's saying that it's a patient person and one with self-control, that it's better to have those qualities to be that kind of person than to be the person who's a successful warrior and takes a city. Because you're going to find if you're a successful warrior, you're going to have fought fights you shouldn't have had to fight. You're going to cause destruction and didn't need to destroy. And you're going to have undermined the potential for intimacy, which is where we find the deepest satisfaction in safe relationships, which we'll talk about on Wednesday. All of us live with intimacy gaps, which we'll talk about on Wednesday. <laughs> intimacy gaps are where you don't quite close the circle. You always end up with these relationships without closed circle. And in that, in that gap, we try many different ways. That's where fear and anger, the things that we've been talking about, prides, like to insert themselves so that that gap never really closes. So we never get the deepest satisfaction from our relationships. Safe, we don't feel safe. See, it's better to be a patient person and one with self-control than one who is a warrior, one who takes a city. It's better to be a patient person and a person with self-control than a person who wins at business and they can really take Success to the nines, because you may pay a horrible price for that. Meek. Meek is an amazing, amazing word. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, a concluding verse for you today. Jesus said this. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, I should have put 29 in there because it goes on to say, because I'm safe, because I am meek and lowly of heart. Jesus called himself meek. By the way, did you know there were only two people in the Bible who had meek as their defining quality? Jesus. The other one was Moses. Moses was a guy that had to go confront Pharaoh. He's 80 years old and he's going into a major fight. And he's going to be a person that he better have some meekness in him because otherwise he's not going to last through this time. Jesus is meek, we know that. So meekness is certainly not weakness. How could you take Moses and Jesus and say meekness is weakness? How could we possibly do that? These are the two strongest men that you could ever have met. Isn't it wonderful you can know the one so intimately? There's a woman caught in adultery, hauled through the streets. I don't know why the man wasn't, but the woman was. Hauled through the streets. She ends up before Jesus thrown onto the ground with a group of angry men who confronted Jesus and said, the Mo the Moses' law says this. We're supposed to take her out and stone her. What do you say? Well, they wanted Jesus to collide with Moses, not understanding that the whole purpose of the law can only be fulfilled by one who is meek. They didn't know what meekness was. No idea what this is. They were judgmental. And Jesus responded to them and he said to them, if any of you doesn't have any sin, throw the first stone. Whoever of you is sinless here, throw the first stone. Go ahead, make it a big one. Throw it as hard as you can. The one that was standing there that could have thrown the stone was Jesus. You want to know why, what meekness looked like in Jesus? Here is a woman that has violated the holiness and righteousness of God. The intent of God that relationship with her husband should be something that's pure and beautiful and strong. And it should fight always for the right. 
And instead, Jesus, in meekness, does not go to the side of the equation. He basically just brings them into her story and says, how is your story different? You who are so angry right now, how is your story different than this woman's? It's a good question for us. How is our story different? It isn't. Yet Jesus in his meekness, because he has all of his power, controlled, so that he can approach with love. And the only thing he says to her is, where are your accusers? Well, they've gone, Lord. Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Go and pursue meekness. Go and pursue the strength to be somebody who, no matter how they're served, no matter who disappoints them, no matter how disagreeable the people are with them, no matter who tries to correct you, no matter who has hurt you, and she probably had a list for every one of those words, and that's why the excuses she would have for what she did, but... Now, it's not about having a perfect husband. It's not about having perfect things in your life. It's about your reaction. Your reaction. And there's only one thing that can control it. It's meekness. If you're stuck in reaction in relationships, no matter what the flavor of that relationship is, meekness is your way. Meek. Strength not used to decimate. Strength not used to win in a competitive way. Strength used to uphold, to bring in and bring your burden. Because I'm weak, I'm lowly, I'm bring it. And I'll help you. You may be carrying a burden today coming directly out of relationships. It might be with a child. Young child. Middle-aged child, grown child. You may be struggling in a relationship like marriage. You might be struggling in friendships. You might feel that no matter what you try, you can't seem to build that kind of intimacy. And your intimacy gap is really huge and it frustrates you and you only know how to run away. Look, wherever you're at, you are certainly not the first one there. We've all visited the same prisons. It's just some of us want to move out of that, and we do. And you can. And you can. You're going to have to be honest with God. You're going to have to be honest with yourself, and you're going to have to be honest with other people. God is absolutely safe. He loves you. It's not a love that can change. Yourself, you're going to have to be honest with yourself so that you have the ability for meekness to come because meekness is based on honesty, on these kinds of honesty. Towards others, honesty, instead of putting on the fronts or hiding behind some fig leaves or running to the place that we'll talk about on Wednesday night. Have I sold you Wednesday night enough? Either way, don't stay where you are. Let's stand together. Father, we bow our heads. We don't understand meekness, Lord. It is a very complex thing, well, but it's a fruit of your spirit. So the way to get to it, Lord, is to surrender to the spirit. And right now he's knocking on some of our doors. Holy Spirit, speak into our hearts about some area of our life where meekness is truly needed. Not weakness, but strength and power under control that can be used not to reach the heights of of ridiculous anger or 
passivity of hiding, but to engage the issues of life with honesty, with courage, and with meekness. Considering ourselves, able to be honest with ourselves instead of those men that were willing to throw rocks. Jesus had to force them, Lord. We see that in that story. She needed to be honest with herself too. Or excuses wouldn't cut it. The cycle would be built if she doesn't change. And Jesus gives her the opportunity. You did, Lord. You did. You said, come away from this cycle. Come on. Go and sin no more. Don't destroy yourself. Don't bring destruction into this world. Be a person of peace. Because happy are those who are meek. They will inherit good relationships. They will inherit beauty. They will inherit strength, lived out, victories. They will inherit good things from you, Lord. So, Father, knock on our hearts. Spirit, you're knocking on hearts. Just, just head bowed quietly. Every one of us walk these same trails. But there's a trail out. Make a firm choice and a firm decision to have meekness rule reaction rather than reaction rule, meekness. Amen. Would you throw that up on the screen, please? Here is a statement, a question that I'd love you to buy into today. In fact, I'd like you to buy into it so much as to take a white card out of that's in your bulletin and to subscribe to that today. Here's your decision today. Today I'm putting meekness in charge of reaction and not reaction in charge of meekness. Try it for a day. Put restraint in through meekness. Don't use what's good in your life to destroy. Don't use that that way. And so I want you to take advantage of that, do that, leave it at Grand Central somewhere. I'd love to see it, but that's a decision for today. Will you put meekness in charge, in charge of reaction rather than anger and fear? No, it's going to be meekness, Lord. And when you catch yourself that you blew it on the anger side or the fear side, you know what meekness looks like then? Acknowledge it, be honest. Lord, you see, I reacted forgive me. To another person, I am sorry, forgive me. Do you know what you're doing? That's meekness. It's also meekness. In our failures, that's meekness. But you will grow if you make that decision. Use the white cards. I'd love to see it. Wednesday, we start with the uh, small groups. There's supper ahead of time, usually around 5.30, quarter to 6.00. And uh, then there is 6.30 start. We wind it up at quarter to eight. Small groups, definitely be here. God bless you. Enjoy the day. And may you enjoy a day with less reaction and more meekness. God bless.
could say, so we call upon. 